It's a great pleasure to have you all here. Uh, this is an event that is being produced by the University of California Humanities Research Institute. I'm David Theo Goldberg and I direct the institute. Uh, and we have a really terrific lineup. Um, what enabled this to happen is a secret workshop on secrecy and transparency <laughs> that is being run over a couple of days and these folks are here for it and we thought it would be a terrific opportunity um, to have folks speak together about a set of pressing questions that all of us are troubling over. And that is, as the sort of the, the old of critical theory has been dying off, to put it kindly, um, the new, if it hasn't yet been born, is sort of trying to emerge, right? And it's emerging very differently and in different sites. Uh, than the sites to which uh, we've been used over the past 50 plus years. Um, and uh, many of the people at the table are engaged in various ways in thinking from different sites of the world about the set of questions engaging us. Uh, and so that's the otherwise and elsewheres um, to, the, um, to the title of this uh, panel. I've asked uh, each of the speakers to speak shortly, five to ten minutes, because there are a lot of folks and uh, we're trying to sort of get um, to the point of generating a, a range of engagements and understandings uh, around these things. Uh, the order in which they're going to speak will be Ashil Mbembe will, will speak uh, first. He'll be followed by Gregoire Chamayou, fourth uh, from, the, from your right. Um, and then Ajaz Ahmad, who's sitting here. Um, and then uh, uh, Li Chang Xiao uh, from Taiwan, followed by uh, Li uh, Hang Chang next to him. Uh, and then uh, Derek Gregory, uh, sorry, then A.L. Weitzman, Derek Gregory, Sarah Nuttall, uh, and uh, followed by uh, Akbar Abbas, who will have a few things to say by way of response and time permitting, if we're not yet at midnight, um, we'll, uh, uh, we'll uh, try to engage a kind of conversation around these things. It just seemed a great opportunity to hear from folks from a range of sites around the world about uh, these concerns. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time introducing them personally. What we're going to do is this, which is very reductive and um, very minimal uh, they're all public people in their own rights. You can go and check them out. You now know their names in order as they speak. Uh, and uh, that will save us a whole lot of time. I just want to thank all of them for agreeing to do this uh, and for the staff putting this together and uh, to all of you for being here. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome to um, the first presentation a Shil Mbembe, a very close friend of ours, uh, who is based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Ashil. Um, I have a set of telegraphic uh, remarks I would like to, to share. Uh, uh, I won't have time to go in detail uh, uh, exposing on, on each of them. <clears throat> the first thing I, I would like to, to, to share with you has to do with uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, dis disagreement um, that uh, characterizes uh, uh, the field of critical theory today. I, I mean by that the fact that there is no agreement today about the state of theory, uh, uh, about what uh, it is all about, about what distinguishes it from criticism. Uh, just like the term critique, uh, theory today, it seems to me, uh, covers a wide uh, variety of uh, uh, acephalic uh, segmentary practices uh, that go from methods to, to question the truth of authority, uh, to uh, techniques to reveal the figures of, of power that operate in, in dominant discourses, uh, institutions or social processes, 
uh, to investigating the limits of, of human reason and judgment. So, so I would, I would uh, say that uh, what characterizes the state of theory today is cacophony. Uh, cacophony um, for a whole series of reasons. Uh, the first has to do with the fact that uh, there have been uh, something of uh, a flight from theory. Uh, I would say of uh, um, uh, the last uh, part of the 20, 20th century. A flight from theory and a re-embrace both of uh, methodological empiricism and uh, born again realism. Uh, so there have been that, but there have also been uh, a return uh, to uh, two things, a return to the ethical and a return to the theological, to which I would add, of course, biology, uh, or if you want, the, uh, the growth of a kind of popular science that has produced uh, a ready uh, public for arguments that seek to reduce human nature to biology. This is a development we have witnessed over the last quarter of the 20th century. The increasing theological confidence of theology and biology has resulted, it seems to me, in the story of, of being human becoming more and more conflated with the story of human nature. That, uh, Instead of asking ourselves constantly what it means to becoming human, we are more and more in a paradigm in which uh, uh, be being human, becoming human, has been replaced by the story of human nature. Now, what, uh, let's say, the flight from theory has left uh, behind us is, I would say, a vacuum, so cacophony on the one hand, a vacuum in which so sociobiology, uh, genetic reductionism, uh, neurosciences, and cognitive sciences have flourished. Uh, what I mean by this is that what we are witnessing today is, in fact, the annexation of some of the core humanities questions of intentionality, of agency, of memory, of sexuality, cognition, perception, language, the annexation of these typical traditional humanities questions by these new disciplines I have, I have uh, referred to. Biology, uh, life sciences, neurosciences, cognitive sciences, and so forth and so on. So that's the first set of uh, telegraphic remarks I would like to, to, to make. So if we want to talk about theory today, this is somewhat of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the background. Second set of remarks, uh, these have to do with the, um, the uh, emergence, therefore, in response to what I have been saying, of uh, new kinds of uh, theoretical endeavors, especially what is being called more and more by many reflexive theory or grounded theory. And here I have in mind the work done by especially Jean and John Komarov, but many others. Uh, Jean and John Komarov summarized all, all of these in their recent book called Theory from the South, where they advocate uh, for something they call grounded theory. Now, what is grounded theory? How do they understand grounded theory? Uh, grounded theory, they suggest, is uh, historically contextualized. It is a, a problem-driven effort to account for the production of social and cultural facts in the world, uh, to account for this production by recourse to an imaginative methodological counterpoint between the inductive and the deductive, the concrete and the concept, the epic uh, and, and the everyday, the meaningful and the material. In other words, uh, it is a reflexive theory, a theory of how history is humanly produced, not as an essence, 
but as openness to contingency. And this is very different from uh, the new kind of uh, 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 developments uh, that is coming from the life sciences and, and the rest uh, in uh, uh, an effort in which, uh, let's say, uh, openness to contingency is uh, replaced by the attempt at domesticating contingency. So um, that's the, uh, the second uh, set of remarks. Third uh, set of remarks, I won't go into uh, Latour argument according to which theory uh, has run out of steam, um, that we keep making the same gestures when everything else has changed around us. In other words, we keep fighting uh, enemies long gone uh, wars uh, that are no longer possible. Uh, Latour basically says that we are ill-equipped in the face of, of threats we have not anticipated and for which we are thoroughly unprepared. Um, uh, in short, that we are on the ready, but one war late. I think that there, 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 there's something to be taken seriously there, uh, but uh, there's also uh, 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 an element there, which is very French in the sense that it's very hyper, hyperbolic. Uh, um, so, so if, if you want, we can come back to, to the Latourian uh, argument uh, during the, the discussion. I just want to uh, end now with uh, two comments on uh, abstraction. First, I would like to uh, argue that uh, abstract theory has never had such a hold on the material and social life of the world as today. And I would like to point out the particular power of economic abstraction as a case in point. Of course, there is always a particular theory of the world, uh, but increasingly, that world is being constructed by invisible entities like finance capital, abstract singularities like derivatives, a business basically that uses theory as an instrumental method, as a, a source of expertise, and as an effective register to inform uh, an everyday life that is increasingly built from that theory. So the point I'm making is that on the one hand, we have a flight from a certain theoretical set of theoretical traditions, and on the other hand, uh, as those theoretical traditions are being displaced, evicted from uh, the sites they used to uh, govern, they are replaced by uh, the logic of abstraction that is nowadays, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, shaping our lives, including in ways uh, we are not entirely conscious of. Let me signal one last thing. As this is going on, we also witness the emergence of critical, myriads of critical, critical practices that are flourishing, uh, uh, practices uh, uh, that are uh, a direct response to uh, an emphatic moment uh, uh, of urgency, which itself seems to, to have rekindled the utopia of the radically new. And uh, these uh, critical practices are facilitated by the, uh, basically, the rapid transformations in contemporary media. Um, and here, I do not simply refer to the arts of transmission of knowledge, but also to the fact that the sensibilities, ethos, interior, and public life of most people today are determined more and more uh, by television, by cinema, DVDs, the internet, computer games, technologies of instant communication. It seems to me that uh, the uh, eruption of these technologies of instant communication uh, uh, in, our, in our life have resulted uh, not only uh, in a transformation in the language of knowledge itself, but also in the displacement of theory. And uh, that displacement only adds to the cacophony I uh, started with, 
and the disarray that comes with it. Now, how is it that we try to respond to this new uh, uh, age of theory in a place like Johannesburg, where some of us work? I'll leave it to uh, Dr. Nuttall uh, to, to uh, give you the answer. Thank you very much. Ashilla has just sketched a contemporary cartography of critical theory. I would like to do something like that, but uh, concerning the prehistory of critical theory. And to do, so, to do so, I would like to go back in time, to go back to 16th century France, and to tell you a little anecdote. We are at the uh, royal court, and this anecdote, this memory, is told by a forgotten French humanist called Henri Etienne. At the court, at the time, there is a debate, there is a discussion, a discussion about the meaning of a word. And this debate grows, people disagree. You find rival explanations. And finally, a bet is placed on the right definition of this word. At the time, Etienne is a respected scholar, and as such, is called as an arbiter to decide between competitors. What is interesting for us is, of course, that this word is the word critique. Etienne writes, I was asked what the word critique or critical exactly means. Not the word used by doctors when they talk, for example, of critical days, but the word used to name those who conduct researches on the writing of poets. I was also asked why one uses the word critique, critics, and not the word criti, judges, in that case. Etienne, on the moment, doesn't let it show, but in fact is really embarrassed, because although he uses the word critique, in fact, as he confesses later, later he has no clue of what it means. Now, I would like to give some, some comments about this little story. You have a problem of definition, and one of the difficulties is that this word has several meanings. First meaning, if you remember the quote I just gave you. First use, it belongs to the medical field. One talks of critical days. This is a classical category of medicine. The idea here is that when you are sick, in your body, there is a fight, there is a conflict going on between two principles, a positive one and a destructive one. And the critical day is that very moment where the decision has to be made. This is the moment where the fight is about to be decided. And crisis is exactly that. I mean, a moment of decision. And the doctor has to be able to recognize those kind of moments. He has to recognize the crisis. He has to have, in other words, a knowledge, a practical knowledge of the crisis. Second use of the word in that quote. This time, this is a very different field. This is a field of literary studies. A critique is someone who conducts researches on the writings of poets. Oh, now, what does it mean? At that time, it doesn't mean uh, something like a literary critic or an art critic. In other words, it doesn't refer this word to a judgment of taste. It refers to something else, something really more technical, uh, some kind of relationship, specific relationship to the text. A critic is a scholar who establishes the text, collects its different versions, checks the sources, corrects the, or the errors, adds footnotes, and so on and so on, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. We still use that word in that sense when we talk about, for example, a critical edition of the text, and this is obvious in that use that critical has nothing to do in that sense with any moral or aesthetic judgment, but with a patient work of establishing something like a textual truth. Third use. Etienne mentions a Greek word, kritai. Kritai refers to judges, but not in Greek, to judiciary judges. 
It refers to the members of a jury that would, for example, give prizes to choruses or dramatic poets. In other words, that's the equivalent of the jury of American Idol or something, you know? And this is important because you see, this is a judge that doesn't judge according to a law, to a positive law, but only according to its own sense of equity. In other words, in short, critique in that sense is taken as judgment, as a reflection on the free power to judge. Now, why do I tell you that? It's because I think that here you have in these three meanings, three main poles that have structured the early canonical registers of what is about to become critique and from, there, from that moment on and later critical theory. Namely, critical theory taken as a knowledge of the crisis, critical theory second taken as an inquiry on textual truth, and third, critical theory taken as a reflection on the free power to judge. Now, my second thesis here will be that the founding gesture of a critical theory of, of something like that is to take, is to import such registers of critique and to take them from outside, from fields as diverse as medicine, study of poetry, or singing contest, and to use these registers to do something different, that is to use them to put power into questions. I give you an example of what I mean. You know, what I call the register of inquiry on textual truth, that's the job of the old critique. When you do that, you ask questions such as, what are, what are the sources for that text? What is the origin of that word? What does this specific word mean? Is it a metaphor? Or has it to be read in a literal or uh, in literal sense? Do set, this set of questions in this field of origin is critical, but in very narrow and technical sense. But these questions, these kind of uh, critical registers, at the beginning of the modern period, they have been taken up by some who began to do something, there, something else with them, that is, to ask them not to poets, not to singing, singers or literary text, but to authorities, and at that period to authorities which were mainly theological political authorities, that is, powers based on the interpretation of the text, on the mastership, and of the mon on the monopoly of its meaning. And when you start to do that, that is to ask the set of questions to do this kind of power, then you, bec you begin to be a threat. You begin to do something very dangerous, that is to threaten their very epistemic foundation. And this will be the starting point of a whole uh, critical tradition, the register of uh, critical hermeneutics. I could develop, but I won't do it. I just catch uh, the other main points of this cartography. Uh, if you take critique as a judgment, as the reflection of the free power to judge, obviously you find there the root of another big register of critical theory. This is, of course, the root for a normative critique. This is, of course, the root for the Kantian uh, definition of critique as a rational tribunal, as a science of limits, as Achille just remembered us. And of course, if you take the other route, the route uh, <coughs> that is found in Hippocratic medicine, then you find another big register that doesn't aim at interpreting or uncover the true sources of the official discourse of power, that doesn't mainly aim at judging the existing norms or at limiting the extension of power, but that aims at doing something else, that is, at analyzing the constitutive tensions, conflicts, and contradictions of any given power in order to develop a, practic a practical knowledge of its crisis. And of course, you recognized the 
associated key figures on, on names, Spinoza, Kant, Marx, and you also have, within that sketch, main uh, conceptual figures for the character of the critical theorist, namely the genealogist, the judge, and the practical doctor. Now, this is just an introduction to our problem. Of course, the idea is that to sketch such a cartography can help, maybe help us to identify new emerging other registers. But I also tried to do something else here along the way, that is to sketch a historical model, a raw one, for the emergence of a critical theory. The idea here will be that the way they appear will be by borrowing their registers to other fields and by displacing their set of interrogations to another object, namely specific historical formations of power. This implies, and I'm, I must, I'm almost done here, this implies that we should be very attentive to those kinds of borrowing today. And we'll go back to that later in the discussion, but I, I believe that the register of forensic, forensics could be a good candidate for such a borrowing today. But uh, I have another idea here, and the thesis will be also that what gives birth to a critical theory is not only the fact that they borrow their registers to other little fields of critique, but also that they mobilize, this, they mobilize this register from a specific site that is, as a generic characterization, from a site that is an antagonistic one, a site that opposes a given form of power. So my conclusion here is that to have new or other critical theories, you will need, at the same time, new critical registers of criticism, but also new sites of antagonism. And I believe that, that this is really worth remembering, because otherwise there is the risk for critical theory to go back to where it comes from, to go back to, from where it had historic, historically tried to escape, and that is namely to be reduced to a verbal sparing match over the meaning of its own words in something like a royal court. What I'm going to say about critical theories will obviously reflect <coughs> part of what I myself do, my, my own identification, my own little niche in the world of critical theory. Uh, <clears throat> and the moment that I want to pick, pick up is the moment when, uh, the well-known moment in Germany between the two world wars under the shadow of uh, transnational rise of fascism and uh, the imminence of Nazi takeover in Germany and so on, uh, <coughs> and as well as the dashing of revolutionary hopes after the rise of historic dictatorships. Uh, <coughs> when originally Horkheimer and especially and uh, soon enough Adorno and others, uh, <coughs> conceive of a certain sort of uh, practice that they call critical theory, uh, <clears throat> in which, as Horkheimer Hor at that moment said, that the idea was to, in fact, undertake a whole range of uh, <coughs> inquiries and investigations across the humanities and the social sciences to contribute to practices of emancipation in these dark times. So that is the moment in the history of critical theory that I want to actually <coughs> emphasize. And these, the two aspects that I want to emphasize is that critical theory as it was conceived at that point <coughs> took place at the junction of the humanities and the social sciences. And that's how the original work 
of the Frankfurt School was in fact organized uh, <clears throat> from very empirical studies of capital and so on to, soci to sociology, but above all, <clears throat> at the same time, philosophy, aesthetics, literature, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> that, I think, is a spirit of critical theory that I would like to see uh, <clears throat> reestablished, so to speak, because um, I would like to say that there may, that there's probably a slightly different way of conceptualizing the same thing that you were talking about. I think what has happened during the last, starting in the last quarter of the 20th century, <clears throat> was a sort of a division or bifurcation or distance between criticism and theory. Uh, you increasingly in, in the literature, you will see the word theory rather than critical theory. And criticism gets specialized to the other side. And the cacophony that you're talking about, uh, I think, is related to that fact. I also think that, that that is the moment when that particular object of critical theory, as it had been originally conceived, becomes very distant from the overall conception of how theory now uh, constructs itself. Uh, <clears throat> so. Um, so these are the two emphases, I think, which are very important. Um, trying to think the world. Uh, <coughs> the, the creation of a critical theory, which is a direct response to the structure of the world and the main crises of the world and the shape of the world as a whole uh, <coughs> in its fundamental structures, uh, especially the crises uh, of, uh, in their case, crises of uh, Nazism and Stalinism. Uh, <clears throat> and indeed, uh, after they move to the United States, their encounter with liberal capitalism, with, which had never enchanted them very much anyway, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, they began to, to talk about uh, an administered world, uh, <coughs> total uh, state and so on, uh, and, and liberal capitalism uh, <coughs> itself becoming a part of that world of the administered society. Uh, that's, that's one thing um, that I wanted to say. I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, <coughs> uh, the second thing that I want to say, which is negatively about that project, that like much of the great thought in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I myself a product of those at least last 200 years. Of, that is one of the lineages that I carry aside from many others which are not <laughs> European by any means. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, they suffered from the chronic disease of what I call European provincialism. Uh, I don't mean the way uh, <coughs> Dipesh Chakravarti talks about pro pro provincializing Europe. I simply mean not being able to see beyond the little principality or little province in which you might be living. Uh, <coughs> so that, um, <coughs> for example, these three grand forces that they talk about, uh, there is in the same tradition of critical theory virtually no recognition at all of colonialism. And that continues to be true of much of critical theory thereafter. In the French theory, for example, the only non-European country that I know impinges upon the writing of some of them is Algeria. Partly because the, some of them came from Algeria, Al-Tizar, and others, or <coughs> partly because Algeria was the, <coughs> the, the war in Algeria was the defining moment for French. Uh, Republican French history of that time. But beyond that, uh, Africa and Asia uh, hardly ever impinge on their thinking by and large. That is the aspect I think you need to <coughs> drastically um, revise and, and restructure for our times. Uh, <coughs> a few, uh, just a week or 10 days ago, I had 
give another, another public lecture in which I, have, I had talked about world literature having to be reconstituted as a South-South relation. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, proposition is that critical theory itself needs to be reconceived and restructured and repracticed as a South-South relation. Uh, <clears throat> which then means that institutional arrangements in places where this is uh, <coughs> this gets attempted uh, will have to reconsider uh, their basic modes of functioning. Uh, <coughs> uh, because when you go from the province of Europe or Euro-American uh, zone to the rest of the world, it's not only a matter of scale, it's certainly very much a matter of scale, but it's also a uh, complexity of a very, very different kind. I can't go into that, but uh, <clears throat> that, I think, is extremely important. My last point is this. The re <coughs> one reason I um, go back to that particular moment in the, of the origin of critical theory in the sense in which I'm talking about, there are many ways uh, in which you can talk about critical theory. You can say, you know, just as, you know, you, you could go back to 16th century and trace uh, history. I'm simply talking about the genealogy of critical theory within which I work. Uh, <clears throat> part of the reason I um, go back to that moment and recapture it is that it seems to me that the moment, the historical moment, today, certainly in the United States, but I think um, in the global world in which the United States plays the role that it plays, uh, we are in a moment that is remarkably reminiscent of, and in some respects, rather similar to the moment in Europe in which critical theory or originally emerged in the sense in which I'm talking about. And it is that kind of sense of global structures and conflicts and possibilities and dangers which needs to be brought, need to be brought back into at the very center, central concern against which we practice what we as humanists or social scientists are doing and coordinate our work, conceive our work uh, in the sense of that wholeness uh, of this moment of danger. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, David uh, for inviting me to, to, to be presenting here. And I have to say that the first, the first time I, I read about and heard of this uh, conception of poor theory that, that was done here, I, I immediately had this sense of solidarity. I think that, you know, that because it also speaks to our discontent and sense of crisis uh, in Taiwan. And so I'm really glad to have this opportunity to uh, some exchange of ideas or exchange of our discontents uh, on this occasion. So, um, okay, and also I'd like to um, uh, uh, begin with uh, um, a kind of anecdote that, uh, that uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, uh, two, of my, two of my Korean friends were organizing a, a, a panel at ACOA conference uh, with the focus on the state of, of critical theory in East Asia and claiming that uh, uh, the, the, the state of, of critical theory in East Asia uh, was uh, relatively robust uh, you know, compared with uh, much of Euro-American uh, academia. And the last time I, I asked them, maybe that's just two months ago, uh, they say um, things were changing <laughs> and, and, and changing very fast. Um, uh, but I, two years ago, I, I had already had some doubts about that kind of assessment. Uh, but uh, I think this is what we what, what you get when uh, 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 much of the uh, uh, you know different uh, academic communities have now been uh, integrated in this in, in, into this. Uh, global economy of knowledge production. You know what is happening here is likely to to be happening elsewhere uh, in the world. So, uh, and I also have this uh, uh, a very good American friend, uh, American scholar, who uh, 
came to our conference on uh, uh, on uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis uh, in Taiwan, and uh, half jokingly telling me that uh, uh, it, it was really depressing to you know travel uh, half of half of the globe uh, to find out that uh, find out there are also a lot of Lacanians like himself <laughs> uh, in Taiwan. Um, um, so, uh, but although I, I seem to be giving you a very depressing picture. Uh, but I think I, 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 I do see some glimpse of hope or, you know, some kind of potentiality uh, that I'm going to speak about uh, now. Um, so I, I, first of all, I have to, I like to uh, locate uh, the moment of theory in Taiwan, although it, it's inevitably, uh, a, inevitably reductive um, characterization. Uh, I'd like to look at it uh, in the early years of post martial law Taiwan, uh, circa 1987 to uh, uh, 1985. Yeah. So, and, and also uh, would just briefly talk about what happened and what could have been, and finally, uh, if I have enough time, what's to be done uh, you know, regarding this uh, impoverished, impoverished uh, state of critical theory in Taiwan. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and I will be uh, also, uh, I have to mention this historical context around that period uh, in Taiwan's history, uh, uh, that there's this, uh, a series of uh, fierce debates uh, revolving around uh, the rivalry between uh, post-colonial, post-colonialism or post-colonial theory versus uh, postmodernism or postmodernist theory. Um, and and uh, this and, and I like to characterize uh, this uh, important uh, moment of theory in Taiwan uh, as uh, first of all I'd like to link it to uh, an er uh, earlier historical uh, periods. Uh, where uh, uh, you know the same kind of reformist discourse. This is the way I would categorize uh, uh, the theoretical discourse uh, in Taiwan, uh, the, the reformist discourse, uh, not uh, and uh, trying to link link it to uh, the earlier waves of uh, uh, reformist discourse. And I like to use this phrase, waves of thought. Uh, in the Chinese language, uh, means literally si uh, chao. Um, so, uh, I, I emphasize this categorization because uh, I think that the waves of Western thought, uh, uh, the dissemination, introduction, translation, etc., of Western thought in Taiwan and also I think in also in other uh, uh, other. Uh, uh, Local context outside of Euro-American, uh, uh, that kind of um, uh, the waves of Western thought uh, uh, seems to be necessarily descending upon uh, Taiwan and also other uh, contexts. Uh, or you know, in in the case of Taiwan, they, and in the the waves of uh, the the wave of uh, Western thought uh, necessarily de descends on uh, uh, Taiwan intellectual scene. On winds of progress, uh, it's you know never just a kind of very neutral, uh, simple uh, 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 issue of translation, dissemination, uh, and and uh, uh, passing on the knowledge, and also uh, because it is uh, linked to this kind of ref uh, what I would categorize as you know quite uh, asymmetrically uh, uh, reformist tradition. Uh, this urge, uh, this uh, imperative to catch up uh, with the West. Uh, um, so, but you know, by pointing to this historical linkage uh, of reformist discourse or reformist tradition, uh, I also uh, like to highlight uh, uh, that kind of uh, relevancy of of theory. Uh, as uh, part of the reformist discourse, and, uh, and it is, it is, it is uh, at one time, it, it did uh, this kind of his, his theoretical discourse 
did have some kind of uh, relevancy uh, outside of academia. So that might be a uh, quite different picture of theory compared with the uh, the 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 um, the kind of uh, 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 self-reflexive or uh, 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 the kind of withdrawal of critical theory at its in its heydays uh, in in the United States at least. Uh, uh, so okay, so uh, but uh, I don't have time to go to the details of. Uh, those debates uh, revolving around post-colonialism and, and post-modernism. But I mentioned this also want to point out that uh, uh, because of uh, those debates, uh, we had this opportunity to go back to look at uh, or re-examine uh, our history and also our historiographies. Uh, so if we take a closer look at Taiwan's uh, complex colonial histories, uh, actually Taiwan at various points uh, was once characterized by multilingu multi uh, multi multilingual realities, ethnic and cultural hybridity, and the potential if not actual existence of multiculturalism. So would such lived experience have been uh, able to be uh, excavated, articulated, rehabilitated, and even celebrated in official uh, ideology as it is today in Taiwan, if the conceptual tools, uh, critical paradigms, and theoretical vocabularies of post-colonialism slash post-modernism weren't available to us? Uh, I think uh, the answer is probably not, uh, but if if uh, if yes, I think there there definitely has to be some kind of um, uh, uh, local tradition, uh, local vocabularies that that would somehow be some kind of equi equivalent uh, to Western theories of postmodernism and postcolonialism. That and and that uh, and 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 all we did were just some kind of a simple question of of uh, translation. But that's another topic. Uh, that whether uh, 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 that that kind of uh, um, importation of uh, of uh, 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 foreign thoughts were just uh, a matter of uh, a simple translation. Now. Um, but I would, you know, to to address the question I, I just asked, uh, I would argue that in the end, uh, after the hype cycle, uh, what gets translated uh, after the hype cycle of postcolonialism and postmodernism, and in the end, I think there isn't any clear distinction between these uh, two schools of thought in Taiwan, you know, with our historical hindsight. But after the hype cycle, what gets translated? and has sustained impact on local cultural and intellectual life actually goes deeper than its mere aura or the globalized structural power and capital that obtains its dominance. Uh, the local cultural phenomenon that appears to be triggered by this postmodern or post-colonial wave of thought, therefore, may also has partly resulted from what remains endemic uh, to the local culture, but has yet to be invoked. Okay, so that's a okay. Okay, I'll I'll try to uh, wrap up uh, as soon as I can. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, the, the, you know, and 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 I I, I said that I wants to talk. Ab I, wa I wanted to talk about uh, what could have been right. So one of the missed opportunities for. Uh, Post-colonial studies in Taiwan, for example, uh, is that uh, uh, that many scholars doing post-colonial studies in Taiwan still view the colonized uh, third world uh, through the, the lens of first world uh, academia and has yet to develop develop any, any deeper understanding or engagement with other intellectual communities that 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 share the experience of colonialism. So the lack of interest and empathy. Uh, 
and also a wall, and you can see that the, the uh, a, a wall view uh, uh, that is uh, scarcely outside the purview of Euro America. That that's uh, what underlies this problem uh, in that regard. Um, so, what also uh, happened uh, after that moment of theory? Uh, after those golden days of theory and also a lot of uh, uh, golden opportunities around that time, uh, was a, 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 a massive and very rapid uh, institutionalization of theoretical knowledge in Taiwan, and and that that uh, you know and and that would uh, if we look closer uh, at this trend of insti insti institu institutionalization uh, is. It's not too hard to see that uh, it also mir mirrors the uh, uh, division of labor, the, the, the specializations uh, that are common uh, in Western ac academia, especially in the English departments and company departments. Uh, so, um, and and after this. Uh, a, ser a series of rapid and massive uh, ins institutionalization. Uh, what used to be uh, a, 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 a an important question that we constantly remind ourselves, which is to say, uh, what does it mean to do theory in Taiwan? And also, you can extend that question to you know include others uh, fields, especially what does it mean to to do 18th century uh, British literature in Taiwan? What does it mean to do Asian American literature in Taiwan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but it seems like that 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 uh, uh, after that moment of theory, uh, right now uh, uh, the the general not consensus, but there's this kind of general abandon <laughs> uh, on the part of uh, uh, Taiwanese intellectuals. Uh, it's just like, okay, uh, they just not talk about that kind of uh, that kind of question is maybe too ambitious and also maybe even an old hat already. Uh, let's just do it. Uh, let's just follow the, the the specialization that you know, and and it's just make sure everyone has his or her place uh, in this uh, academia that is linked to the uh, the greater uh, uh, global uh, system of knowledge production. So, um, but what what I can uh, uh, tell you now is that uh, 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 theory uh, to even to those who are uh, somehow uh, uh, skeptical about uh, the future of theory, and also maybe even for those who are hostile to uh, theoretical knowledge uh, in the first place, uh, people agree that theory is the common, uh, and I will put it this way: uh, theory is the common we cannot own, but can lay, but can lay claim on uh, a commonality, but not a solid foundation beneath our discourse that cannot be positivized. Um, uh, so, um, with that in mind, uh, I I would just um, uh, this this is our the, the kind of uh, conception of uh, theory and also uh, that that we uh, at this uh, the 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 small group that 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 uh, that I belong to uh, have uh, the, you know a kind of tentative uh, consensus we have. We have, we have, we have arrived at. Uh. So uh, I, I would like first of all like to uh, quote a friend from Hong Kong. We, we we had a workshop last month in the midst of the uh, the Occupy movement, and he said that events precede thinking, or event precede theory. So theory to us, uh, a lot of society, many societies in East Asia, is not a epistemological question; it's an ontological question. It's about, it's not really about identity, but in terms of being, in terms of uh, our bearing with the uh, historical or, or political situation in East Asia and also in relation to the world. So, uh, <clears throat> so you know, you know in, in the high day of uh, theory development in Taiwan, I, I was uh, working on my MA and PhD degree in Taiwan, so I, I was part of it. It was very popular, something like a train. If you study in a foreign language department, in comparative literature department, you have to do theory. It's the, the, well, a lot of people will say, well, it's just a mimic what the Western 
masters are same as a matter of fact, what is involved is, is a kind of epistemological drive coupled with the question about who you are uh, in, in, in that context. And that's why Li Jin just said that uh, along with the suspension of the martial law in 1987, and, and, and that year initiated a, a whole process of social change, cultural change, and, and, and also uh, change in, in, in terms of knowledge. So uh, <clears throat> from that perspective, I, I think, well, again it's, again, it's about the moment of theory or, or about thinking in, in, in the crisis, because at that time we see that reality was kind of dissolved into a kind of obscure form. So that, so that there, there appeared some features for us to reach beyond something which we, we, we didn't know what, what it was. So I think maybe at the present moment, we, we may be able to see, to envision, to envision another moment, another so-called kairos of theory in East Asia. So what I'm, I'm going to say is a, a document which I and some colleagues wrote up in order to uh, promote what we, we want to do, want to gather some people doing theory and who are also concerned about East Asia together and we, we can uh, do, do something in order to create a new paradigms of knowledge during the age of globalization. So what I'm going to say is about what, what, what is happening after, after the 21st century, and it has intimately to do with globalization. So uh, this project we, we want to initiate is to establish a global scholarly platform or alliance that adopts critical theory as a common methodology to tackle East Asia issues and uses English as a working language. Well, because it covers several societies using different languages. So, and, and, and uh, the pe people we want to uh, work with include individual scholars, academic institutions, and scholarly communities across the world. And our task is to set up a platform of exchanges and collaborations among concerned scholars and to, to uh, execute some research and publication projects together. And our aim to is to create new paradigms of theory studies in or of East Asia in the age of globalization. So uh, globalization itself exemplifies uh, it's, uh, something like the modified effect of chaos theory. Individual cultures can no longer keep to themselves. The changes in one country might have great impact on another situated in a far away region of the world. In this environment of free floating movements and ubiquitous risks, culture has no fixed location, and the relations among cultures are no longer linear ones between given points, but constitute a kinetic link system. One side of the emerging crisis is the intensifying mergers and integrations among international political and economic powers, practically forming a supranational structure of dominance. But the other side of the crisis about thinking in the crisis is that the fluid system makes possible multi-serial concatenations of cultures and thoughts. A culture is no longer transported unilaterally from dominant powers, as in the case of Americanism. In this new conjuncture, the ability to enact multiple linkages determines whether individual cultures can find their dynamic and multi-serial positioning in this era and effectively respond to the new structure of political economic domination and to create new modes of knowledge. Today's East Asia has broken loose from the static oppositional relations of the Cold War era and entered into a new stage of dynamic adjustments with all the tensions and possibilities this entails. As in other parts of the world, many changes in East Asia are very much global in nature or in effect. Therefore, the contemporaneity of East Asian thoughts depends on whether the intellectuals of this region can find features in the clashes between external thoughts and internal culture, entrench spaces of thoughts, and build up new linkages. Against the ever-concentrating movement in the chain of transnational political economic powers, the intellectual world needs to establish dynamic assemblages, otherwise the humanities would not be able to cope with the crisis of our time. So if East Asia studies were once subject to Western academic hegemony and monopoly, the current rise of East Asia, the condition of dynamic globalization, and the emergence of fluid system of knowledge mean a growing importance of East Asian scholars' voices. 
and the set in between Scott in terms of us people doing theory and and uh, I also concerned about the the, the local uh, cultural historical context in East Asia so in terms of uh, that specific group of of, in, of intellectuals I, I I kind of describe them as uh, as being positioned in, in in between the local and the global so <clears throat> So I, I think that those people we, we like to talk and to work with uh, <clears throat> is, uh, can be described as in-between scholars. And I think they should take a better position, should be able to take a better position to grasp the relationships between external globalization and internal particularity. With Western specialty training and embodied knowledge of their cultures, these in-between scholars of the humanities and social sciences have to connect with each other to move beyond their intellectual oppositional enterprise in their respective societies and the, and the all quagmire of self-enclosure. And this was why Taiwan's previous reductive nativization was pushed into a kind of dilemma. And the disruption of fixed cultural units has presented our contemporary age with a problem much more complex than simple localization could solve. Furthermore, if unable to adjust to the present dynamic conjuncture, linear connections, I mean, between point to point, and interactions amongst to no more than fixed lines, not are merely extensions of points, and there would be no substantial changes and no multi-serial assemblages of the kind required by our contemporary situation would be possible. So, mm, it, well, I... Mm, from my own opinion, neither the past orientalist introduction of traditional studies and comparative literature's previous international integration of cultures, nor the unilateral or single point research and collaboration is innovative and responsive enough to tackle our fluid contemporary situation. New modes of thinking and new passages of knowledge have to be created. To that effect, humanities and social science scholars need to acquire a critical theoretical perspective, a dynamic serial positioning of thoughts, and the ability to move beyond and concatenate the multi-layered fluctuations between thoughts and cultures, and the capability of enacting cross-cultural exchanges and assemblages. Critical theory, being the shared vocabulary of contemporary intellectuals, can be the common denominator for the collaborations in this project we are initiating. And, and, and uh, the, the theory oriented the positioning of, of our project refers not only to pure theory research, but contemporary Western critical thoughts combined with East Asian thoughts and culture in order to respond adequately to the limit to the multi serial fluctuations among the global, the regional, and the local. Owing to this multi layered network, scholars in the, the project we are, we are working on embarking upon either creative synthesis between Eastern and Western thoughts or cultural and social analysis should be able to move through the undulations between global waves, regional plates, and local strata. And, 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 and I think that group of scholars would be able to effectively respond to the contemporary conjuncture and to produce creative assemblages so as to set up new paradigms of East Asia thoughts and knowledges. And from my own perspective, I, I think well, <clears throat> since uh, the, in terms of us people in, in many societies in, in East Asia, the, the uh, epistemological question, as I said, is coupled with the ontological question. And, and, and now, somehow, maybe I'd be, be able to, uh, to, to provide a, a temporary answer about why theory start, study suddenly was closed off uh, <clears throat> after the, 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 the uh, 21st century. It has to do with, the, with this process of globalization. Somehow, during the, the, the late 1980s, the Taiwanese society and maybe other societies were opening up so that this whole structure of life, of, of politics and, 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 and culture were becoming weak and becoming fragile or, or, or say, porous at that time. And uh, with the rise of uh, with, with transnational capitalism and, and uh, globalization in the uh, early 1990s. Somehow you see that there were a lot of changes and fluctuations that were happening in, 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 in this region. But somehow, beginning with the 21st century, somehow this uh, 
situation was becoming steady down with this uh, establishment and strengthening uh, between multi-capitalist corporations and, and also between different interested nation states. So, so well, it's a strong sense of us people in Taiwan that we, we, we are, as a matter of fact, in a critical moment. So if, if we say that event precedes theory, then if we are unable to grasp the, the event at the present moment, if we are un, un, unable to, to uh, make use of the features that, that well, features always appear in the temporary moment, if we are unable to grasp the, the, the features, then, then, then probably we we'll just have to uh, face our, our destiny of being determined and defined by, by other powers. So, so some I think that cri crisis in our existence in, in, in on the ontological level is necessarily coupled with the, 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 the theological or, 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 or say uh, epistemological drive. And, 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 and this is why we try to gather up people together in order to uh, create new modes of thinking, in, in order to respond to, uh, to, to the changes in, 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 in this region, <coughs> and also uh, to, to create possibilities for us to imagine and to, to, to envisage our bearings, uh, or critical bearings, or some other much more creative relationship with other people in, 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 in the world. So, so this East Asia project we are initiating at the present moment it's a it's focus on East Asia, but it's just a, a temporary stage because we think that place itself is very important. Place itself is a, is a site of events and happenings. And it's, it's because you focus on that place, so that subjectivity will, will be able to emerge. And then we start subjectivity as the basis, which is necessarily a critical subjectivity or, or subjectivity that questions the, the different mechanisms of determination. So we stay establish that of that critical sub subjectivity, then we'll be able to reach out and to uh, search for so for much more relationships, create relationships with other cultures and, 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 and other groups or, 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 or people in the world. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm an architect. I'm kind of new in this, uh, so I don't even have much to say about how it sort of it shifted within my career, but uh, or my thinking my thinking about uh, various political <coughs> problem, but I would say that for me, um, if anything, critical theory is an attempt to construct the truth and how, uh, and to think how, what is needed uh, to do it. And how, perhaps not to construct, but to reconstruct now a truth that is in ruins. Uh, and I think it is very hard uh, to do it. I think that it seems as if um, I think I think a lot of critical theory, at least from my perspective, seem to me to be um, a certain attack on notions of truth or the kind of uh, uh, sort of a repressive bodies of knowledge that we had to open up, uh, we had to challenge, we had to, and, and I think that perhaps uh, for me today the, um, the task is, is, is to, to think again about how one can have a certain commitment to, um, to a truth in a situation where um, it is under where power operates through an attack on that uh, notion, and I think that this is uh, this was the reason that I I kind of started an experiment um, together initially with my students and now uh, in a kind of in a larger scale, uh, which is to um, to start what we call the forensic agency. Uh, but a very uh, different forensic agency, I think, to the one that uh, is otherwise uh, practiced, say, by state or by the police. And our forensic agency is constructed out of scholars, of the f um, um, theorists, artists, and architects. 
And um, in a sense, we were we started by being rather attracted to uh, the term that stands at the origin of uh, of forensics, and that is the Latin term forensis. And we thought there's something interesting in forensis um, that is that is different than forensics. If forensics is now understood very much as the act of the police, as a state looking onto its subjects, um, policing them, surveying them, um, that in inverting that gaze, there is a certain, um, uh, th th uh, that there is a certain necessity to invert that gaze. And we thought that forensis, in a way that it was, the Latin word forensis, in a way that it was used by um, by the Roman orators, that actually, uh, when they when they meant when they used it, they meant something that is much wider than the performance of uh, the articulation of positions within the court. Uh, forensics came from the forum, and uh, and effectively with a kind of a uh, presenting uh, a certain a truth or constructing truth within a public within a public domain and with the with the kind of the history of that term a certain telescoping occur no and it becomes slowly the form refers simply to the court and forensics becomes the presentation of science uh, within it and but in a sense forensics allows us to take our um, attempt at kind of very detailed interrogation of facts that we uh, look at through architecture and through the media in which it is captured and and somehow open it up to a political practice and open it up and, and return the forensic case. So no longer the state looking at its citizens but um, citizens, subjects, uh, looking back uh, at the state itself. And when we started that um, project, the Forensis project, um, we were kind of committed in to, to do two things simultaneously. On the one hand, to look critically and historically at, uh, at the history of uh, forensic practices and the way it has evolved um, and it's what we called, uh, perhaps together with Thomas Keenan, the forensic aesthetics. How, how, um, uh, what is the role of aesthetics in the in the construction of truth? On the other hand, to provide, to really kind of provide uh, um, forensic services for organizations, very practically for organizations that were confronting state action in various places uh, worldwide. And that often put us in in uh, incredible situations of contradiction because when you are an expert witness in in court, and of course all our cases were uh, cases that were put against states and corporations, um, uh, and it happened at least twice that defense lawyers were quoting at me um, critical things that I was uh, writing about uh, about the truth. I, if you are claiming that this is fact, how come uh, in another place you are speaking and complicated the, the, the art of um, making truth or making facts uh, in the world? When I was in court, um, I realized something very important. I realized what is a threshold of truth. And um, the what is expected of expert witnesses presenting things in court is a level of certainty of 85% and above. So I understood that 85% uh, is true and 84 uh, is false, but I did not know how to calculate it. But I was very interested in that remaining 15%. Either there's 15% of possibility of falsehood within truth, and that truth is still actionable inside court, right? So I think within that, that tension, that kind of imperfection, that attempt at, of construction, uh, it, is, it was very important to keep 
those two modes of interrogation, a critical interrogation to truth construction, while still claiming the truth with what we were saying, still still trying to affect it and uh, and and produce um, and believe that it is still true, although fifteen percent of it are in doubt. So what does it mean? What does it mean, this kind of imperfect truth? What does it mean to, um, to claim things against power? I think that those 15% come from something that is an inherent paradox uh, in the work of inverting the forensic gaze. So the, the kind of the history of forensics has many characters, but you know maybe one of the more interesting of them is a man called Bertillon, a French uh, policeman. Uh, and for him, forensics 101, eh, the, 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 the very uh, main principle of forensics is that the state, eh, the police, must see in higher resolution or in better optics than, uh, than the criminal. So if somebody uh, shoots with the bare eyes, the police would need a microscope or a telescope. But anyway, you would need that kind of advantage. And in fact, police work operate continuously through producing that differential in vision. When you invert the forensic gaze, you always operate in a kind of an epistemological inferiority to the state you see in lesser resolution, you have less facts, you cannot produce the truth of a situation in a, in a reality that you have fragments. And the question is really how to use those fragments, those weak signals, in order to, uh, to provide uh, a certain counter-narrative uh, in situations um, in which you have no, no further uh, facts. Now, there are many things and there are many examples that I can discuss um, in relation to those uh, imperfections. And, and really, most of our works uh, are about those imperfections. But I think that exactly those um, pieces, fragments of truth that we are able to produce against acts of state denial, um, the, the problems that we are mainly dealing with is a kind of violence that is always double. It is violence against people and things, and it's a violence against the proof that violence has taken place in the first case. No? That it's, a, it's a violence against, it's, it's always an entangled thing, and this is how it operates. State violence need denial in order to perpetuate itself. It needs to create those kind of gaps. Uh, and, and it is within there, sometimes you have uh, weak signals that kind of push in the opposite direction. Um, you have, uh, uh, sometimes uh, we were speaking today, it exists in a kind of in a shade of a pixel that you cannot see exactly whether it is destruction or not, or in a kind of, um, sometimes it's in, in, a, in, a, in a memory of, of, a, of a survivor uh, that you can mobilize against the kind of those acts uh, of denial. But I think those kind of proofs, those kind of truths that we produce can never exist only inside the forums in which they are brought. They need political support. They need mobilization around them. They actually, they're existing under the threshold of the law, under the threshold of detectability, under the threshold of uh, and against state denial, mean that effectively that they could be in excess of the law and uh, that uh, that they are brought uh, to. Sorry, are you giving me signs to stop? So I think I think really the situation that we find ourselves in, which we always know less, is that we're always under the threshold. 
uh, of detectability under the threshold of the law means that we need to take, we need to mobilize uh, politically uh, around those uh, weak signals. Thank you very much. I should say at once that I come from a field which for rather too long has assumed that the world exists in order to provide examples of its theorizations of it. And for me, theory is a medium in which I work. And so for reasons which I think will become clear, I have no intention of mapping critical theory. What I want to do is tell you a story drawn from recent work that I've been doing, focusing on modern war. And my starting point, like so many historians, I suppose, was the Western Front during the First World War. Now this was, in all sorts of ways, a profoundly optical war. Paul saint -Amour has written about this quite brilliantly, but it's a conceit which carries through virtually all forms of modern war. What I mean by that is that it privileges optical, visual, and essentially cartographic knowledge. Now, the way in which that knowledge is produced turns out to be a wonderfully intricate, vital part of the story. Because what we know about maps is that they're not merely representations of the world. They are, in certain circumstances, performative. They produce the world. And much of the violence which took place on the Western Front could not have taken place, literally, violently taken place, without a vast apparatus of aerial reconnaissance, of photographs, of mapping, maps which were consistently drawn and redrawn day by day by day. One of the major images of the Western Front, I suspect, is of warfare which had ground to a halt, which was static, those two front lines on either side separated by no man's land. This is perhaps the point to draw attention to what must be obvious to all of you, that the only bodies in question so far talking about critical theory are astonishingly male bodies. But still, let me go back to the Western Front. It turns out that that image of a static war is entirely duplicitous. Stasis was only possible because each side knew so much about the other because of those aircraft, because of those maps, because of those plans. And they quite literally orchestrated the conflict. There's a wonderful passage in Tom McCarthy's novel Sea where he describes a pilot soaring above no man's land, spotting enemy batteries and transmitting the signal back to the British artillery. And he says that he doesn't think of what he's doing as a deadening. He thinks it, of it as a quickening, a bringing alive of the battle. But as I say, this was essentially an optical, visual, cartographic war. And it was in all sorts of ways desperately relevant to the soldiers in those trenches and in all sorts of other ways desperately irrelevant because the knowledge that they produced you know this from St. Hanu Das you know this from Eric Lead didn't privilege the visual and the optical at all it was a profoundly somatic sensuous knowledge the only way in which they could survive was through heightening and quickening the other senses hearing smell taste and touch Now, I want to insist that those were ways not simply of apprehending, but also of knowing and navigating the battle space. And the reason that matters is that those knowledges are firstly critical. They are ways of resisting military violence, of surviving against all the odds. They're also, of course, profoundly vulnerable knowledges. Let me read you just one passage from a corporal. When sound is translated into a blow on the nape of the neck, a sight into a flash so bright that it actually scorches the skin, when feeling is lost in one disintegrating jar of every nerve and fiber, the mind at such moments is like a compass when the needle has been jolted from its pivot. In a sense, that enlightenment project of domesticating the senses, of establishing what it was possible to know, to see, to taste, to touch, to smell, and in fact, what it was permissible to know through sight, through touch, through taste, through smell, was rapidly dislocated on the Western Front. And that affected the sense of self. It affected the ability, or more accurately, the inability of soldiers to separate themselves from the earth in which they fought. 
They feared that they were losing their humanity and slipping back into an unnatural nature. Now, this matters because it seems to me that one can trace exactly that same process, and this is what I've been concerned to do over the last several months, in fact, more or less the last year, through the deserts of North Africa in the Second World War, through Vietnam in the 60s and 70s, and right the way down to Afghanistan today. Soldiers' bodies are not just vectors of violence, they're also victims of it. Now, I rehearse all this for a number of reasons. Firstly, because of what, what I've just said isn't confined to soldiers and their fleshy, vulnerable bodies. It extends, too, to civilians. What is it possible for civilians in Iraq, in Syria, in Gaza, to know? Particularly to know when an air raid, which of course privileges the visual, think of planning an air raid using photographs, using maps, using a whole series of navigating systems to get aircraft overhead. But what is it possible to know when your world on the ground contracts to a cellar, a room, where you can't go to the window in case it smashes and the, and the fragments scar your body? When everything you know depends upon sound, not sight? When the possibility of rescue depends upon touch on your figure, fingers scrabbling through the rubble? So all of this is, I think, transmissible, and in a sense, it's generalizable. I mention it, too, because you could, of course, say that all I had to do was go and read Merleau-Ponty or <laughs> Kurt Levin. But that's not how I approach this at all. Frankly, I'm much less interested in Kurt Levin and Merleau-Ponty than I am in the bodies and the lives of those soldiers on the Western Front, in North Africa, in Vietnam, and in Afghanistan. Not least because I want to disabuse people of the lazy politics in which the left cares about their civilians and the right cares about our soldiers. But also because those actors were absolutely central in the making and the unmaking of human history. But I've told you this story for another reason too. Because I sometimes think that high theory is rather like the cartographers of the Western Front, rather like those generals back at GHQ, plotting movements on the map. And one of the infantry said, you know, he said, I think our function really is to be those flags on the map, to be moved here and there, knocked over, and if we're lucky, buried. And I'm not sure that the solution for critical theory is to turn away from mapping the Western Front to mapping the Eastern Front. It may be that the problem is in the cartographic visual metaphor with which we start, and we need a much more serious and probing interrogation of the visual, which is precisely what Al has just offered us. Thank you. I want to say something quite brief about the question of location and the, you know, how we might come at this question of elsewheres and what it means, if anything, for theory these days. Um, and I, um, you know, I mean, the first place I would go to try to think about that is try to say, well, you know, I work for an institute in Johannesburg, South Africa, and then, you know, so what are the implications of the kind of city in which I work? Uh, what are the kinds of institutions that we need in order to undertake the activity of theory? What is the theory that this kind of context poses? What are the intellectual modes that a city like this requires? Um, so on the one hand, those kinds of very specific questions. And on the other hand, the sense that we really are now, um, partly through the kinds of collaborations we have with David and many, many other people around the world, speaking the same kind of language. Um, and I think we get ourselves into all sorts of difficult <laughs> moments around what it is that might be different about uh, a particular location. So I want to um, express to you the, 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 the confusion and interest of working from a, a location which, uh, such as Johannesburg, which is, I would say, cosmopolitan and xenophobic at the same time, which is invested in the project of desegregation and resegregation at the same time. Um, but interestingly, which is still undoing a history of legislated difference and trying to re build something that is not the past, trying to build something that's called the after apartheid in a context of the, uh, uh, 
the flourishing of democracy in, res in some respects, but also the failure of freedom. Um, so I think the question of critique is extremely complex. It does turn to the question of how you um, make something or build something or reconstruct something at the same time as you do the work of deconstruction. Um, I think that um, you know the, the, the question of critical theory has been remarkably helpful um, to us in undoing the work of apartheid, but really is in so many respects, as some of my colleagues here have thought about, in a great deal of trouble. In, um, one of the ways of renewing uh, critical theory, I think, is precisely by rerouting the kinds of discussions we have through multiple circuits of debate. Um, and so something that we do at, at WISER is to pursue this question of publics in an incredibly rigorous way, day after day, week after week. And it seems to me that the reanimation of theory lies somewhere there. I think it's possible to make the argument that if you work in the South, there's a kind of capaciousness of theory. There's a sense of working, some people called it working to the South of theory rather than theory from the South, um, that I think is very helpful to us and relates um, to a very strong sense of the future that we work with. Um, and can feel almost all the time. There, there is a renewed sense, I think, of Africa as having a future at the moment, um, somewhat like after the period of decolonization and immediately after apartheid. Um, so I think the question of the future was really a horizon that was lost or was not self-evident. Um, but it's a discourse that has been drawn very strongly by economists at the moment, far less so by artists and people working with the literary. Um, and that's a question that we could ask of ourselves as to why that is happening. Um, by and large, I think the texture and the affect of theory and the project of theory at the moment has everything to do with trying to keep open um, the space of, a, of the city against the kind of sequestration in graded communities and so on as new kinds of influx control present themselves to us all the time, trying to keep that space uh, uh, open. So that return to the future, if you like, um, is the significance of place for me at the moment. Um, and simultaneously, how we square this with the, very, the powerful effects of the past and of trying to return this continent, this place, um, to a place of having been rather than as a place of becoming, and the importance of articulating the role of thinking and thinking in public. Um, I think that theory is also animated very strongly by questions of race, uh, race as form, uh, new versions of whiteness presenting themselves, a kind of offshore whiteness, if you like, um, in South Africa very strongly, the complete inadequacy of certain versions of racelessness, but trying to find another uh, kind of relation, an ontology of relation, a form of becoming in relation to race, very, very strongly present with us. One of the strongest, uh, um, most well-attended events on our corridor um, was about theorizing rape recently. On the other hand, I can feel the pull towards empiricism and ethnography and away from theory from some of my colleagues. It's something that I think um, we're trying to fight very strongly. The argument is that you know you can only really speak to social justice if you work again with empiricism, with ethnography, with data, with information. And uh, the rest of us trying to pull very strongly towards theory, indeed to undertake the complex question of thinking about rape, of thinking about gender violence and so on. Um, I do think that critique is in tremendous trouble, and I think that um, people like Latour, Karen Barad, Manuel de Landa, and many others who are turning to the kind of new materialism are really helping us to renew theory in a fundamental way. So I'm feeling very appreciative um, of that at the moment, of thinking about the African Anthropocene and how we might access African cos cosmologies to think about the human and the non-human, the visible and the invisible, the social and the natural. To, write, to try to think about harnessing the resources of life um, from the point of view, the forces and the resources of life from the point of view of um, the African archive. So these are the kinds of questions that, that animate um, our corridor. Um, some interesting anecdotes just to finish off with, um, just to talk about this, this problem of the question of location and how complicated and sometimes very funny it is at the, uh, you know, at, 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 at to negotiate at the moment. Um, we did a video link up with some students at Yale a while back 
um, and our institute was launched, as it happens, to try to think outside of the policy realm about the post-apartheid, about the after-apartheid. And it so happened that we launched on the night, unbeknown to us, of course, of 9-11. And so we're thrust into um, um, a changed local and a changed global condition. And then we, had, we tried sort of co-teaching for a while by video link up, and we talked to some students at Yale, and one point one student said, you know, you know we've been through this thing. You know, it's called 9-11. Have you guys heard of 9-11? And it was this interesting moment of, you know, attempted sort of cultural sensitivity plus combined with theory from the north. And what happened was that people in our classroom started laughing at that, at that moment. Of course, we've heard of 9-11 and we work with it all of the time. I, w I attended last weekend in Cape Town a meeting for directors of humanity centers. Um, and a couple of us started talking and after about five minutes, um, guys from Seattle and from... Yale and from Harvard and others said, well, this is really very confusing to us. We've come here all this way to hear about the African humanities and you guys talk just like we do. And it's that same moment that my colleagues from Taiwan were talking about, that I think that increasingly we are, um, <laughs> we, we are having the same conversation in the way that we simply were 10 years ago. And that, that notion of, of sameness and actually carving out conversations that we have together tells me that one of the things that we need to try to be doing in relation to renewing theory is pursuing this question of how we, um, you know, work more and more to deprovincialize every single person or fragment of the conversation who is around that table. Um, and having worked with this center for so long, over about seven years, you know, you can actually see it in action. You can see it happening over the last seven years, how we do those kind of multiple deprovincializations um, and those kind of rerouting of discussions through those multiple circuits of, of, of debate. Um, I am feeling uh, in need of blood sugar. I'm extremely feeling tired at the end of a long day. So I think I'm going to leave it there um, on that question of location and would be very willing to come back um, through the discussion in uh, question time. Thank you. Now having listened to the, uh, to the panelists and uh, um, uh, because there are people who have thought a lot about uh, uh, these problems. Uh, it actually uh, makes sense, so I'm going to sort of abandon what I wrote and just uh, do something a little bit different. Uh, it's a kind of uh, surrealist game that I'm going to propose. You know the surrealist uh, uh, idea of uh, taking any two words and then finding a connection between them. Right. So what I'm going to do is to just uh, uh, divide the eight speakers into groups of four. I mean, so groups of two. So, so you have four groups of two each. And uh, I'll just sort of, uh, in a kind of completely arbitrary way, just uh, compare one to the other and then see uh, what comes out of that. Right? I mean, it will probably be as good a method as any. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so I've got my notes here, which are uh, sort of, you know, all mixed up, and David says I have five minutes, right? <laughs> so I'm going to take ten, uh, starting now. Um, okay, so le let me start with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, um, Achille, and it's not a sort of commentary on everything he says, but uh, the, I was taken with the first point he made about, um, uh, not just about cacophony, but about this uh, 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 emergence of a kind of ethical and, uh, and theological uh, uh, moment in uh, critical theory. And my comment on that uh, would be something like this, that, uh, that I think theory today uh, cannot be, a theorist today cannot be an apostle. Uh, a theorist today has to be an apostate, right? uh, uh, like a heresy. Heresy is, as it were, the, uh, the, the starting point of, uh, uh, of, uh, of theory. Like betrayal uh, becomes like a, 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 a really Im important trope. Now, the, uh, Pasolini, the uh, Italian director, wrote a, a very good, uh, uh, a very exciting collection of essays called uh, Heretic Empiricism. Right? And, and the whole question of the empirical Right, comes back in, but the empirical as, uh, as the heretical. And that, that could be one starting point for, uh, for thinking uh, some of this stuff. Now, uh, Achille also makes a point which I'm going to link up now with uh, Gregoire. 
on uh, about the the rise of like uh, the 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 replacement of um, you know of uh, uh, of humanist uh, uh, arguments and humanist issues by biology the the, uh, the life sciences and human sciences and so on. Now the I think uh, if I now jump from this to to what Greg Gregoire was saying, I think one of the interesting points he was making was that uh, criticism would uh, has to or, or critical theory has to begin by t taking something from outside, right outside the field, and uh, it seems that the uh, uh, for example, I mean this would be uh, could be a question to ask you. That the uh, there are different ways of using, for example, neuroscience. I mean, there are critical theories like uh, Catherine uh, Malibu, who, who will be uh, joining us, I think, soon, uh, who does this in, in a really uh, an interesting way, uh, which is not like uh, uh, simply taking the hard sciences and, as it were, uh, transcoding uh, the uh, uh, humanist uh, 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 language um, uh, uh, to that. So, um, Gregor also ends up with this whole question of uh, uh, the fact that we need uh, new registers and then uh, new ways of thinking theory and, of course, new sites. Now, the, the question of sites, I think, then becomes something that uh, a lot of other people uh, uh, spoke to. Like, a site, a site could be Johannesburg, a site could be, uh, could be Taipei, uh, it could be uh, uh, Hong Kong, it could be Mexico City, and so on and so on. So this whole question of sites, then uh, you know, new registers, which uh, as it were come out uh, uh, through um, uh, uh, through new sites. So that's the that's as it were the first pair. Now then the the next pair. Uh, let's see how this is going to work. Right, would be. Um, I think it's uh, Ajaz and then uh, uh, Li Chen. Now, I think Ajaz uh, um, uh, started with uh, a point about uh, Hochheimer and critical theory. And of course, we know that the reason why Hochheimer called what you know, the Frankfurt School uh, did critical theory was that he, can't, he couldn't call it political theory. Uh, critical theory was really a, a way of talking uh, politics, but you can't talk it directly, so it, be, it, it, it called itself uh, 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 critical theory. And you, you have here this sort of, uh, you know, as you pointed out, the, uh, this uh, as it were, uh, uh, working together of, of the humanities and, and social sciences, which is also an aspect, I think, of what uh, uh, Gregoire was, uh, was saying. Now, the uh, one point I want to um, uh, 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 take him up, up on is the the um, the his critique of the uh, of critical theory and and of the Frankfurt School, uh, and which he accused uh, maybe rightly from a certain point of view uh, uh, of a certain uh, form of uh, European uh, provincialism. Now, the I think my comment on that is would be as follows: I think provincialism is inevitable. I mean, we are all provincials. Uh, uh, you know, a kind of global cosmopolitan uh, 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 standpoint. It's always a bluff uh, that's waiting to be called. Uh, so it's as if uh, it's like the the provincial is what we uh, uh, we uh, we uh, we have to uh, uh, start with. But of course, having said that, I think we could add another point, which is that there are different ways of being provincial. Uh, you, you know, it's not as if you know, the provincial means, uh, uh, means one thing. I mean, another way of thinking the provincial, of course, is this, uh, uh, you know, if you want to put it in, in better sounding terms, uh, grounded. Right? You, you're grounded, you're, you're part of a uh, particular side. And this then leads me to uh, compare um, uh, what Ajaz is saying or, or juxtapose what he's saying with, uh, with uh, uh, Li Chan who uh, was talking about the critical theory in, uh, in Taiwan, right? Uh, and of course, then seeing it as a kind of uh, 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 grounded site and, and so on and so forth. And I think several people have um, um, told a story uh, with the falling point that, uh, you know, uh, what happens here 
happens everywhere else, right? You, 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 you go to uh, uh, China or, or you go to uh, um, uh, Taiwan expecting to see a Chinese city, and what you see, of course, is a version of, uh, of a kind of global city, uh, and, and you get disappointed. But you see, I think th the point I'll make here, of course, is that is there such a thing as a Chinese city, for, uh, to take an example? And I think the answer is yes, even though it might not look Chinese now. Because, you know, if you go to China expecting to find the, the Chinese city uh, that you have in your mind, right? that the Chinese city is a city that, uh, that has to look like this, of course you won't find that. But it doesn't mean that, you know, in spite of all the, uh, uh, of, all the differences and, and mixtures of things and, and the this so-called uh, uh, global moment, it doesn't mean that there isn't such a thing as a Chinese city. I mean, it's just something that you have to, like, uh, uh, sort of in investigate before you can see uh, 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 where it is. Now, the, um, then I think uh, Li Chen uh, uh, situated or tried to situate the, uh, the moment of critical theory uh, with this moment of, uh, of crisis, the... Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the post martial law, Taiwan, uh, 1987, uh, 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 and, and that's when, you know, the, the reformist discourse. But the, the first, uh, as it were, the first uh, 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 instance of, of this, the, the, the first theorizing, uh, was this whole question of, um, you know, catching up with the West. And of course, when you do that, you, you haven't, so this is not a reformist uh, 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 dis discourse yet. Uh, the, and the other point would be, uh, and this I think could be a crucial point that we can come back to later on, that what you see, of course, uh, very, uh, very much, I mean, whether you take Hong Kong or, 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 or Taiwan as examples, is that colonialism itself does produce a certain form of multiculturalism. Right? That, that colonialism is, is uh, 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 a way in which, as it were, you know, uh, a kind of uh, anticipation, you might say, of the, uh, of the, the colonial city is kind of anticipation of the, uh, of the uh, global city. But this is multiculturalism in the sense of, uh, and this is a phrase that we hear again and again at nauseam, that you see that in places like Hong Kong, a mixture of East and West, right? Like the, the, the multicultural is this mixture of, now what's wrong with that notion and that phrase is that when you think about a mixture in this sense, the mixtures are easily separable. You know, it's like you, you have you know, European houses and, and, and Chinese houses, or you have Europeans and Chinese in the same restaurant, but it doesn't mean there's any sort of integration. So you know, a mixture of East and West is one aspect, and uh, I think that would uh, take us later to, to Sarah's point, right? A, a way in which, uh, shall we say, a kind of, uh, uh, um, the, uh, a kind of uh, traces, you might say, of uh, apartheid, uh, 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 continuous, right? If you think in terms of mixtures uh, in this way, you, you haven't, as it were, changed shall we say, the, uh, the, uh, the object uh, 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 itself. Uh, so where am I? Uh, so that's, uh, that's three and four. So now five, five, five and six or so, uh, like two quite different ones. But let, let's uh, look at uh, Hong, Hong Chong's, which he said was a kind of supplement to, to Li Chan's. And he begins with this quotation, sort of uh, events precedes theory, and uh, maybe I'll come back to that uh, 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 later on. Now, but one of the things he was saying, which uh, uh, um, I think is interesting, but which uh, we could sort of focus on a little bit, is the way in which he describes the, um, the creation of rigid networks of power, uh, and these networks, rigid networks, uh, as were networks of, uh, of domination. And the way in which uh, resistance uh, consists in, in a kind of fluidity right? and, and, and a way of uh, uh, avoiding and evading uh, this, uh, this rigidity. The problem here, it seems to me, and this is just a, a question on the table, is that nothing is more fluid than capitalism. 
I mean, the, the whole point of capitalism is that it, it doesn't have any rigid form, right? That, that it does, that it is a kind of fluid uh, 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 thing. So it's as if, uh, you know, the uh, fluidity, fluidity versus rigidity might not be the, uh, the way to go. Uh, now, you also talked about, like, um, um, Taiwan uh, nativism, which uh, at a certain point was how, uh, you know, Taiwanese identity was, uh, 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 was thought through and the inadequacies of that. Now, I think it's inadequate not just because it's too local and, and, and too localized. I think it's inadequate because we are now in a situation where the, the local is there, but the local has become dislocated. Right? Or the local has become, as it were, uh, 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 without locale. Uh, it's as if there is such a thing as a local, but to say, to ask what it is, right, where is it? I mean, that's when the problem uh, comes in, right? So it's not as if there isn't uh, such a thing as a local, but it's just this whole uh, dislocated uh, 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 um, um, way in which the local works, which, is, uh, which becomes uh, uh, I I important. And this, I think, would have something to do uh, linking up also with uh, the, the, uh, Ajayas' point about provincialism. It's like we can be provincial in a way where the, the local uh, can be uh, dislocated, right? And this, for example, uh, 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 um, yeah, what, five minutes? Uh, no. Yeah, you have five minutes, but he, he has ten. So. <laughs> <laughs> Who has ten? Ayo has to leave in ten. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, okay, let, let, me, let me then get to, uh, get to AL. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, uh, obviously AL made a series of really um, um, uh, interesting points, but I think one of the ways in which I might sort of link up uh, 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 Hong Chang's uh, and AL's uh, 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 um, presentation is uh, in this notion of events uh, precede uh, theory, right? So, so, so much so that in, in a sense, you know, theory is always uh, theory in ruins, and that's how uh, Eyal begins. That, like the, that for him, critical theory is a way of re reconstructing a truth, but a truth in ruins. And this is something, I think, for me, related to what I was uh, trying to say about, um, uh, about heresy, about uh, a kind of truth, but a heretic truth. Uh, and the reason why uh, I think uh, truth has to be uh, uh, heretic is that, uh, you know, what we call truth is never something that is complete. Uh, uh, I mean, it's both complete and not complete. I mean, what you have is, is uh, something that you might describe as the, as the kind of uh, the incompleteness of the complete. And that is how I think, you know, the, the question of truth might uh, 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 um, uh, show itself. Now, the I thought what was really interesting was the uh, was the notion of the uh, of the forensic and, and the way in which you uh, uh, you uh, were trying to explain how uh, it's not sort of forensic in the in the police sense, but really uh, turning the forensic uh, against itself, right? Uh, uh, as a uh, uh, returning the case, and of course, where this led to is the way in which uh, your forensic, which is the, the, the forensic of the, uh, shall we say, of the poor, uh, is, um, works with the 15%, works with imperfect uh, 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 truths, uh, works uh, with, as it were, low, uh, low resolution uh, 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 um, uh, images, works with fragments, and works with weak signals. But the, I think the, 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 the real interest then of the, of the forensic was really to see how, uh, how these uh, 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 things which are under the threshold of uh, visibility and detectability, all these weak moments, how they can be uh, placed in, in, a, in, in, in a another context so that they have a, a different kind of efficacy. Now, it's not that different, I think, from what uh, some of us are trying to sort of uh, uh, put uh, forward as, uh, as poor theory. 
right? the, 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 weak, the weak moments and, and the weak signals and, and what you can uh, uh, um, do with that. With that. <laughs> All right, then, uh, so my final pair. Uh, Derek and, uh, and, 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 and Sarah. Um, let's see. Uh, I think uh, uh, Derek's point, uh, I think he, uh, he is sort of vaguely uh, uh, connected with geography, right? you know, it's a kind of job. <laughs> but I think it's interesting that he starts by saying that he's not going to give us a map. There's no mapping of, uh, of, uh, of critical theory. Uh, instead, what he gives us is a kind of narrative, right? Uh, it, uh, it's a story. So instead of a map, you have, you, you have a narrative. And the map then becomes, as we're always, uh, a, an image of, of, the, of the domination, you might say, of the optical, the visual, the cartographic, and this whole question of maps, which doesn't, as it were, uh, uh, um, represent the world, which in fact uh, produces the world. And I think he... Uh, he, I think, very interestingly opposed that to other forms of, uh, of sensation. So it's really a, a, a talk about the, what, happens, uh, or, or, uh, what happens to the human sensory uh, under these sort of uh, 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 very uh, critical conditions, like what happens on, on the Western Front. I mean, uh, Walter Benjamin has a famous essay uh, with a famous uh, paragraph saying, you know, People, soldiers return you know, from the Western Front uh, unable to speak. They can't talk about their experiences because they don't understand what they felt, right? Uh, because, it, I mean, it was a war that was unlike any, uh, any other war, right? Because it contradicted everything that, uh, that you knew uh, about the, the, the human uh, sense of. So, so this whole thing then of... Uh, of uh, 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 of uh, uh, the human sensorium being dislocated on the um, on the uh, Western Front now, but he ends up, and this is uh, maybe a question I might uh, want to put to him, uh, 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 suggesting that high theory uh, or high theorists are like generals, uh, uh, you know, uh, plotting uh, wars on uh, on a map and so on and so forth. But uh, I think what a lot of other people have been maybe trying to say is that we, we need another view, right? Another way of thinking through uh, uh, high, uh, high theory. Now, Sarah, I thought uh, uh, her most interesting point for me was this point about how to reconstruct something, right? How, how within a, a particular uh, AR, yeah, was it something I said? <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, and the and the the question of the uh, of the future, and the and this allusion uh, uh, at at the end towards towards the, uh, the, the, new, the new materialism, the, the, the new um, uh, philosophers, which uh, it, from one point of view uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, is trying to revive a kind of phenomenological project but without intentionality, uh, without the, the experiencing uh, subject uh, at the center. So uh, by just doing that, you shift the, uh, the emphasis to a lot of other things. So, so this kind of new materialism uh, I think can uh, have many repercussions uh, beyond just philosophy. I, I mean, the, the way in which you, you might take that and go. I want to thank all of our speakers and your collective patience. Um, uh, obviously, this, these are issues to be continued um, in discussion uh, among and between, uh, and we look forward to your engagement with this. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>